very much. Uh, so I, I do quite, <laughs> you did mention the both party, so now most people will talk about it and think about the both party during this call, but I, I'll do my best you know, to keep it brief and keep it interesting for you guys. So thanks again, Andy, for your presentation, and thanks uh, to Valley Space for the opportunity uh, today to present in front of you. And a special thanks also to everyone that presented so far. I have to say, you know, uh, I had high expectations, you know, based on the speaker's uh, list, but I really was blown away. Today has been a treasure mine of uh, insights and information. So at least on my side, in my you know, early career so far, I am uh, so blessed to have been here today and listened to all the lessons learned and all the work and experience that these people have. So thank you, thank you very much for that. And I look forward to the next uh, talks, you know, after me and tomorrow. So let us get going then. So my talk today is called Moonshot Technology. It's a very ambitious title for a very ambitious company, my company iSpace, uh, who is going to attempt uh, basically the first commercial lunar landing and transportation program. And uh, you know, at this point in the conference, we really covered a lot of ground. So I've realized throughout the day that a lot of the topics that I want to talk about and I will talk about resonate very closely to what you've heard already. So you will see a lot of similarities, a lot of uh, issues that we run into during the early stages of development, the uh, things that we changed along the way and the things we adapted. But one thing that maybe I can add uh, to today's uh, plan is showing you a few examples of how we actually used our tools, a few exact examples of how Valley Space uh, and other tools have been used within the iSpace frameworks to be able to deliver these products and hopefully you know, uh, succeed when the mission does come along. So uh, stick with me, give me a chance, you know, and then the both parties coming soon. So. All right, so Andy already covered this, so I'll be very brief. Uh, my name is Federico, I'm a systems engineer at iSpace Europe, which is the European subsidiary of iSpace Inc., a Japanese company that also has an office in the US, in Denver, Colorado. Uh, over there you see on the left, I don't know if I'm trying to compete with uh, Skyler for the cringe level today with a little dance, but I think he still wins. He let me know afterwards, but this is me working on uh, the M1 or Mission 1 lander that will be launching from Cape Canaveral at the end of this year in Q4. And if all goes well, land on the lunar surface, soft land on the lunar surface uh, next year uh, in Q1. I will be not just covering my system engineering duties, but I will also be a spacecraft operator for this mission. Uh, we are about a dozen of them based in Japan and four of them based in Luxembourg as backup uh, duties to make sure that the, even though the spacecraft is fully autonomous, uh, we can recover certain situations which are uh, off nominal or dangerous for the spacecraft along the way. I graduated with a master's in aeronautical and aerospace engineering from the UK, and today I've met a few people actually from the UK, so it was a, it was a pleas to be able to speak again, you know, with this, uh, this culture and these people. Uh, and indeed, experienced at Amazon, G, SES. SES is a satellites company based in Luxembourg uh, with a fleet of about 75 satellites, so I had an um, uh, internship experience there where I basically modeled their, uh, their polarization frequencies from the fleet. Uh, I'm also a member of, for the UK people, again, apologies to everybody else, but I'm a member of uh, the Royal Aeronautical Society, uh, which uh, if you have come across in the past, please come to me and let's chat about it after the presentation. And I have a few certifications in project management and Lean, uh, Lean Six Sigma. Uh, on top of that, I've also been active in uh, mentoring. Uh, that's something that I always wished I had in my early, you know, let's say academic life and professional life. And that's why I, since more than a decade now, have been, I've been doing this with young school pupils and also young professionals. So this has been one of the most rewarding, you know, uh, opportunities that I've had to be able to work and to see these people grow and uh, achieve great things in the industry. Actually, I had one of them that was hired by SpaceX last week and he, uh, he sounded the most excited, you know, human being I've ever talked to in the past. So these are really soul fulfilling uh, moments and I'm really proud of, uh, of, of meeting these people along the way. So very brief on iSpace. Today we're all engineers, so we're gonna go straight into the technical, but very quickly. So the company was founded just over a decade ago uh, in 2010 and hires almost 200 people, of which 25 plus nationalities. Why did I write this down? Because we're gonna get to that topic throughout the presentation, but it is not actually trivial. It is not easy to manage and work with and collaborate with such a vast array of people. That's the array of standards, uh, experiences, uh, cultural backgrounds. So, this is something that will come back to us later on in the presentation. We are about two thirds of uh, the entire company as engineers. And our key businesses are lunar transportation, both on the lander side and the rover side. The lander, of course, will take us from, uh, from Earth to the moon, and the rover side will help us explore and prospect the lunar surface. Uh, but also with uh, partnerships, as well as lunar data, particularly for the data, 
we have developed a number of tools uh, of which uh, I'm allowed to show you one, uh, one output today to be able to mission plan uh, surface operations using our rovers. So knowing things like the topography of the moon at that latitude, knowing uh, sun visibility, horizon visibility. So this we actually commercialize it. We will be able to commercialize it in the next uh, months to come. So the other companies, as there is a growing number of lunar exploration companies, will be able to foster this and, and use it as well. Uh, yeah, some financial strength. We uh, uh, collected the basic series A, B, C of funding, almost $200 million. The more important thing is that we work with a vast uh, array of customers and partners, uh, both from the private side and the public side as well. So you can see a lot of uh, agencies which are either flying with us on our missions or are technical reviewers of some of our products during the, uh, the life cycle of these products. Uh, for instance, NASA, JAXA, ESA, uh, and some others which are flying with us as payloads, as I mentioned. So the Emirati Space Agency, you can see on the left, the UAE Space Agency, will actually fly a 10 kilo rover with us on M1. Uh, that will be one of our core payloads that will, uh, will reach the moon's surface later on. Uh, and of course, we have also a commercial partners. So for example, SpaceX will be the one that launches us uh, for the first two missions from Cape Canaveral. Uh, using a Falcon 9, and we were just announced also which Falcon 9 for, uh, for M1, which, you know, uh, I mean, it's cool in itself, but when you're told exactly which one it is, how many times it flew, how many times it landed, it's still pretty cool. So it was a, it was a fun day for everyone involved in the company. So. Uh, but anyway, let's keep going. So what exactly are we trying to achieve? So we are trying to establish a lunar ecosystem, which sounds like science fiction, but, you know, give me a chance here. We have a number of missions which are planned and within our scope. And two of these are already uh, under development or ready to go. So M1, which will take off, as I said, Q4 this year, is complete. The AIT phase, which is assembly integration testing phase, uh, has recently been uh, completed with uh, Ariane Group, a company called Ariane Group in Germany. Uh, and it will be shipped to Cape Canaveral uh, by the end of the month. So this uh, has been fully booked in terms of a payload capacity already a few, uh, about a year and a half ago, actually. So we have a capacity of 30 kilos of instruments that can fly with us, which go from science to engineering. Uh, and, and these actually have been disclosed already publicly. They include the uh, rover from the Emirati Space Agency, uh, a uh, solid state battery by a Japanese company, some machine learning driven uh, imaging systems by Canadensis. Canadensis is a Canadian based entity and others as well. So we're not gonna go through the detail of that, but this mission is now complete in terms of the uh, uh, pre-launch phase. So we're entering phase D and we'll be able to launch and operate in the next uh, months to come. M2, that's our mission two. We'll still be utilizing the uh, same lander type. You can see it's the Series, lander, series 1 lander type. Uh, and that will be launching in 2024. This recently has also been fully booked. So we had a few payload kilograms left to, to book, and uh, we managed to close the entire capacity. So these will be announced uh, in due time. But they run along the same lines of you know, science payloads and engineering payloads. So you will be, be hearing more about this in the future. And again, SpaceX will be launching us here. So the whole point of these first two missions uh, as part of the Akuto R program, Akuto actually means uh, white rabbit. There is a legend that you tell Japanese kids there is a white rabbit jumping on the moon. So, uh, you know, to raise a little bit of awareness and fun amongst the young generation. So we, we call ourselves Akuto R. Uh, these two missions will be dedicated to technology demonstration. So we need to first demonstrate before we can prospect resources on the moon and explore what is available to us we need to demonstrate that this technology is feasible. This technology can be developed in record time, it can be developed with very limited budgets, and it can be developed with a supply chain which has been you know, demolished by the pandemic and other problems. So there are many risks and many conditions here which we're trying to demonstrate are possible to achieve and to do. Uh, so hopefully in iteration 23, when uh, if I'm invited again, maybe we'll talk about that. We'll talk about some of the stuff we collected from, from there. Uh, we also have further missions which are being designed at the moment. The one that's more advanced will be M3, using the uh, US lander, which is called Series 2 for the time being. Uh, this one is a larger version uh, of the Series 1 lander, which can take uh, 500 kilograms of payload. Uh, and for this mission, we actually will be able to survive a lunar night and perform actual prospection of lunar resources with payloads that come with us. So uh, it is the next natural step and the next progress step for the company. Uh, still need to select the launch system. We are uh, compliant with uh, SpaceX in terms of the envelope, but we haven't decided yet, so we'll keep you guys uh, in the loop. But this is our, let's say, short-term goal. Um, I will show you now a little bit what I mean by uh, complex products, because today has been you know, a, uh, a funfair of incredibly complicated and incredibly exciting developments and products. 
And honestly, when I see this picture, and I see the pictures that everybody has been sharing during the previous talks, I probably should have thought about it better. So <laughs> this, this does give me a little bit of a migraine to, to look at. I mean, this is what a lunar lander actually looks like. This is our M1 lander that will be flying soon, as I said. Uh, and these are some of the uh, AIT technicians that are completing the, uh, the final integration stages. Uh, so, I mean, without further ado, you can clearly see that such a machine, alongside all the machines we talked about today, but such a machine requires an insane amount of uh, interface management, incredible amount of planning, incredible amount of uh, you know, coordination. So uh, I will try and cover during this talk today how we as a company, iSpace, have uh, basically started our tool chain journey uh, to help us with this process, to make it less manual, to make it less complicated and less you know, of a burden to system engineers to basically uh, go one by one and check that the configurations are up to date or the baselines are up to date. Uh, and uh, this applies, of course, not just to the lander products, but also to the rover uh, engineering products, uh, which I will show you some pictures of as well. So the entire uh, iSpace Inc. tool chain framework is based on one consolidated and company, you know, approved, let's say company recognized approach, which we will talk about uh, later on. Okay, so a little bit of a better photo because the previous one, I just wanted to skip to the next slide already. So this is still the same lander. It's the Series 1 lander, but I split it down into key uh, subsystems. So of course you can see that there is, uh, we have actually the main structure is made of two bodies, uh, lower and upper monocoque uh, assemblies. Uh, we have tanks, which are gonna carry the fuel that take us to the moon. We have a primary thruster, you can see here, which will be used to propel us forward towards the, uh, the moon. And six RCS thrusters, which will help us control the, uh, the orientation, uh, where we're going, correct the orientation where we're going. Other aspects are, for instance, the uh, landing gear, which has been developed, it's basically a titanium um, assembly from a company called Citizen Watch, uh, which I didn't know personally about, maybe some of you do. Uh, it's a, it's a watchmaking company that uh, is very popular in Japan and helped us produce these landing legs uh, with, uh, with a titanium, um, titanium product. Then we have solar cells, which will be used to generate power throughout the cruise to the moon and also on the surface when we do land. We do not plan to survive a lunar night, which means we will be using uh, the, uh, the solar cells to keep us alive throughout the lunar day of about 14 to 15 Earth days. That's the equivalent. Uh, and other things, you know, amongst uh, you know, this, uh, this image, you can see there is some imaging systems like radars or range binders or even the PR camera at the top of the, at the, top of the lander. And in, most importantly, the payload bays. So we can carry payloads internally and externally uh, to our landers and rovers. Externally, of course, we'll have to go through a bit more careful uh, interface management, also in terms of you know, thermal survivability, radiation survivability, because there is no protection from, you know, during the cruise from uh, solar particles or uh, uh, cosmic uh, background radiation. So the ones that are actually accommodated inside the payload bays will have a little bit of a better journey, so a little bit of a more protected uh, trip to the moon. And usually these are our bigger payloads, so things like the, uh, the rovers, uh, for instance. So, uh, iSpace now has been, so I've been in iSpace since 2019, and uh, this whole concept of the tool chain has been along uh, shortly before I joined, when uh, we were going through a number of challenges uh, in our preliminary definition of these products. So when I joined, actually, we were in the early phases of the rover development and in the, let's say, phase B-ish of the lander development, the lander you just saw, which has been built. And we wanted to come up with a way to fix these challenges. So we had an issue where we had a decentralized approach and basically manual verification of all of the engineering design, the preliminary design that we were doing. And this was difficult. We realized this was gonna be difficult to scale throughout the entire life cycle of a project because you cannot basically work separately. You need to collaborate and coordinate activities between the subsystems and the different uh, software teams, et cetera. So it's maybe manageable in the early stages of, uh, of a project, but then as you progress and as you become more mature and complex in the product, we'll not be, we will not be able to contain it and maintain the, uh, the quality. Another thing was that we had problems with data traceability. So this was inconsistent. We couldn't basically flow down to the relevant discipline. So if a thermal engineer was asking for something, oftentimes it would be very complicated to find the parameter for him or for her. Similar for structural engineers, you know, uh, we wouldn't have one localized uh, platform or one centralized platform that enabled us to quickly give answers and quickly give uh, way forwards to the subsystem and the assembly teams. So what does this mean? This meant an increased workload on the system team because we had to find you know, all of this data, we need to make sure that it's the latest iteration of it, we need to make sure the baseline as part of the configuration was the correct one, and it was prone to error. 
because when you do things manually, you know, you can be the best uh, engineer in the world. Uh, however, there is a, there is a risk for, uh, for things going wrong or for you picking something that might not be correct and then flowing down throughout the entire life cycle. So we had problems with this. And last but definitely not least, it was a global project. It is a global project. And uh, that means global problems. But in terms of what? So this is in terms of the standards that we use, you know, ECSS in uh, Europe, uh, JAXA standards in Japan, NASA standards in et cetera, et cetera. So we need to find a commonality to be able to work together and deliver these products together without losing any pieces behind. Uh, things like terminologies as well, or even units of measure. I mean, all of you here have had experience with this. Uh, everybody has their own preferred way of working forward, and we need to make sure to have one way, one baseline way that everybody approved and everybody agreed with. Uh, and also, as important as this, team working practices or team culture. Because uh, it might be easy to say in words, you know, team culture can be fostered, it can be, uh, you can lead people to follow you and you can create a good harmonious environment. But when you put Japanese people, American people, Italian people, Colombian people, Argentinian people, I can keep going, 25 nationalities, in one room, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fest. You know, we're basically having a party, which uh, it's, it's quite, in the beginning, it was quite complex to understand how are we going to handle this? You know, there is the people that talk all the time. There's the people that are quiet but have the best ideas. So how do we handle this? How do we make sure we get the best out of everyone? So we had a few targets that we set for ourselves and we set for uh, looking in our tool chain, uh, let's say market scoping or market research, what we were looking for, to be able to achieve uh, the quality level of the products that we were building. And actually you can see a few iterations of the, um, uh, one of our rover uh, designs, which will be flying on one of the next missions. So we wanted to make sure that all of the technical data and all of the engineering documentation, whether it's internally you know, distributed and disseminated or it's dis disseminated with external providers like customers or suppliers, uh, was up to date and easy to basically deliver depending on what the intended audience was. So this should have been, we wanted to get this process to be uh, seamless without even thinking about it. Uh, as I said, we wanted a centralized platform. We didn't know what the platform would look like, but we wanted some centralized way to trace all of our data and also access it by the wide project hierarchy. I think one of the, old, one of the presentations today mentioned you know, transparency and trust, you know, being able to access the information at any time. This is what we needed. You know, engineers asking a question, got it, you got the answer. Management, got the answer. Customers, et cetera. And this had to be done throughout the entire project, not just at the beginning when it's phase zero, phase A, et cetera, but also when we reach more of a critical phase, the critical design review and so on, which becomes more complicated, of course. Um, and next, we also wanted to have, uh, with this tool chain that we were looking to develop, some way to uh, integrate, if we were going to use different tools from different companies or different entities, a way to make them work together without having to think about it. So any you know, compatibility script that had to be developed, any way to merge these, tool, these tools together to make one framework, we wanted to ensure that we could do this once and then scale it, you know, certify it and then scale it to, uh, to the full project. So we didn't want to redevelop at every single stage of the project. We didn't want to rewrite the script every time because, I mean, you need to assign one or two full-time engineers to the job every time. So, uh, and also, as I said before, removes human error because once you certify it, it's a software uh, process, it is highly unlikely to fail or highly unlikely to give you the wrong information when you request it. So, and it saves time. Okay, so we did a little bit of a market scoping, and this is definitely not all of the things we looked into, but some of the ones I decided to share with you today. Uh, and they're primarily based on MBSC, DDSC, and uh, more collaborative platforms. So MBSC, everybody, or most people here I, I would know uh, uh, has experience or knows about this word, model-based system engineering, which is basically uh, models that are related together to help define, design uh, the, the system which, were being, which is being developed. So some examples of this that I've used in my career or that I, you know, I tried to prototype for this tool chain uh, is Capella, uh, Cameo or System Composer from uh, Simulink, MATLAB Simulink. I don't know if anyone here has, uh, has used it. So that's, that's a valid way forward. DDSC, which is data-driven uh, system engineering, is a bit more of a modern one. Valley Space is a good example of this amongst other tools. Uh, and this allows us to organize our engineering data and all of the structures with this data. So maybe the product tree, the decomposed system, all of the different assemblies, et cetera, linked in a proper way and in a way that can be also uh, exported and extracted, so fetched for you know, sizing the system moving forward. So uh, I will show you a couple of examples of how we implemented this, but we wanted to make sure that uh, this represents the foundation of the process, you know, grabbing the information and grabbing the parameters upon need. And last but not least, collaborative tools. So 
several people today mentioned the terms, you know, Atlassian Jira, Atlassian uh, uh, Confluence, Kanban, etc. So we equally, as iSpace, made a decision at some point to move out from the traditional MS office tools. Of course, we still use them, but uh, the Atlassian environment uh, works much better for us in terms of traceability, version control, uh, and also connections with other tools. So I will, I will give you an example now how we do it. Uh, so anyway, uh, this is one other thing that we studied, one other thing that was part of our literature review, and that we considered uh, moving forward. This was done uh, about a year and a half or so ago. So I believe this actually was, uh, was shared in the previous presentation, which is great news. It means that, uh, you know, our process is, uh, is making sense. So this is uh, the Valley Space lifecycle that was shared by Marco and the rest of the team. So what iSpace uh, basically converts towards is a tailored version of the value space model. So we basically from one to seven have adopted this model by allocating specific tools and specific uh, platforms that enables us to uh, handle the data the way we need, collect it and store it, but also to fetch it whenever we need and perform physical calculations, you know, uh, let's say mission sizing calculations like power budgets, thermal budgets, you know, uh, mass budgets, et cetera. So we just wanted to have a way to go seamlessly from one step to the next step without having to manually copy and paste the value from one box to the next. So uh, things like Jira to Valley Space, it was a company decision to keep our requirements, uh, baselines and configurations on Jira, the Atlassian Jira um, R4J plugin, which is the requirements plugin. Uh, and we basically made a way to transfer these uh, autonomously in Valley Space, which would be used for functional analysis to basically check if we have any lack in the design. So if a requirement maybe is not covering this particular part of the product, or if we need to add new requirements because we cannot fulfill this particular function for the rover or for the lander. Equally, once this is in uh, value space in terms of requirements, we want to make sure that we can run uh, sizing activities. So like I said, the budgets. And value space doesn't just do requirements engineering, but also was nice because we could do components and Bali definitions. So you can define the entire uh, product. So you can decompose the entire product uh, by uh, subsystem, assembly, even if you want components or elements. So, we stopped at the assembly level, but you know, if you want, you can go pretty low. I don't know what the exact number is, but you can go quite nested. Uh, so, and this is autonomous. Autonomously, we, uh, once the product tree is defined and fetched, we can load it into MATLAB and then run calculations, run physical models. Uh, then when we need to do more de detailed design work, for example, you know, we need to use Autodesk, you know, CAD, AutoCAD, or we need to do uh, FEM or thermal simulations. Those would be done on uh, particular tools that the subsystem engineers use. And once again, uh, they don't need to fetch the data manually. This will be loaded into you know, FEM uh, tools or thermal desktop, et cetera. Uh, so in the interest of time today, I'm going to just show you some parts of this tool chain uh, that we use today and how we connect the different, uh, uh, the different programs together. In particular, I will show you the requirements. I will show you the parameterization of the, uh, the product tree and also how we do actual testing. You know, testing, uh, we mean both on the virtual side, virtual environment side, but also in the real world side, which I will show you some photos of. So once we go from the MATLAB environment, we can test it also in a real world simulant. Uh, and for the rovers, that's great. For the lander, you're kind of stuck in place, but for the rover, you are driving around, you're performing a mobile mission. So this is a very good example of what we need this for. Uh, so let's go and show you some uh, examples. Okay. So here's a case study uh, when we were prototyping this. So the step one was to set up the entire product tree. So our entire system. I'm not showing you all the details here. Please uh, bear with me, I, I'm not allowed. But anyway, you get the gist. So I'm showing you, you can see each system and then uh, individual subsystems and underneath that you can have components and assemblies, et cetera. And all of these have specific parameters which can be uh, defined and can be uh, basically validated within this environment. So we're talking about mass, we're talking about uh, power and duty cycle, so based on which mode the, uh, the particular component or assembly is performing, uh, you would have a different duty cycle. So maybe 80% of the uh, consumption or 10% uh, of the consumption. So this you can define within value space as well. Data rates, for example, how many kilobits per second is this particular electronic component generating at that point in time? So this is how we would uh, do it. So we configure it within this environment. And then next, we would uh, configure the actual modes. I mentioned the word modes just now, so let me show you what I mean. Uh, we define uh, system level uh, modes, both for our payloads and for the, uh, the rover itself. So let's say this rover system. Uh, and Valley Space enables us to then trace each state of each sub-assembly or sub-system 
as part of this, uh, uh, of, this, uh, of this tool here, of this plugin that you can see on the left side. So you can see in dynamic mode, which is when we rove, we would have some components being on, some components being in standby, some components being off. Equally, when we're static, so we are in standby, but we are ready to move, which means some components will then go to standby, some components will be moving. So to give you a gist, uh, depending on what the rover functionally needs to achieve and which mode we need to transition, Valley Space enabled us to trace uh, which one of these components would do what. And the good thing about this is not just, you know, it's quick to, quick to define. So you, you can basically quickly click on the drop-down menu, set it up. Uh, you can manage it and see the version control. So in terms of the history, how it changed over time. But you can also do uh, this. So you can do, uh, using the requirements engineering plugin that uh, Valley Space provides, you can actually trace specific, yes, of course, parents and children requirements. But more importantly, things like components that are traced to that particular requirement. So requirement 48 refers to the communication subsystem, or requirement 62 refers to the control and thermal subsystem. So by doing this, and also having the verification matrix generated in the second to last uh, column there on the, on the left, uh, we can basically uh, trace the entire capability of our products. We can check which requirements are fulfilling which function, which of these functions need which products to be fulfilled, and which of these products uh, can actually feasibly be part of the rover product or part of the rover configuration. So we're kind of going, you know, doing the entire life cycle here uh, within one, one environment. Uh, as I said, Jira, it's on the left here. Jira is what we use for the uh, centralization of the requirements. So we do not use uh, Valley Space for uh, requirements centralization. But autonomously, if any change comes across from Jira, it gets loaded into Valley Space and we get a notification and we can perform the sizing activity again. So we don't need to, add, before you ask, we don't need to add manually new requirements because I would quit the company. So next, uh, this is actually one that uh, is very important to us, which is the actual technical budget. So how do we uh, validate our products? Because we can talk about it, but we, you know, we actually need to have some real numbers. We need to have some real outputs that tell us mass-wise we fit within this envelope, this requirement. Power-wise, you know, we don't go over this limit, which would basically fry the, the electronics, you know, these kind of things. So, the sizing, as I call it, sizing activity we do on MATLAB is very important. And we found a way to autonomously, through the API of Valley Space and also some scripts we made, uh, go from Valley Space in one click into MATLAB in a compatible environment. So everything that you see as part of a product tree will actually be read and interpreted within MATLAB within a few seconds. Uh, of course, you know, we're not talking about hundreds of thousands of components. I think the, the lander has about 500 in total from the bill of materials and the rover has maybe 200. So it's a lot of components, but it's not, we're not talking about ISS scale you know, projects. So this is robust enough for us to, to do that, basically. It's robust enough to contain this level of, uh, of information. Uh, and we generate uh, one of the many scripts. I just showed you the one that looks nice, the architecture one. We can generate uh, a MATLAB readable, a MATLAB compatible architecture file, which has all of the information about the rover. So I don't know, uh, the panel size, the panels, uh, maybe generation capacity, depending on the angle that you set. Uh, the components, which ones they are, what's their mass, what's their you know, power, if they're electronics components. So all of them are within MATLAB. And then uh, another interesting part is how do we simulate what the rover would do and if the rover is feasible without a mission? So of course we can do an arbitrary mission. We can drive straight, maybe 100 meters, come back, and again, and again, and again. But we have a mission team, a science team, that has knowledge, topographical knowledge of a lunar surface for the uh, latitudes that we're interested in and the areas of interest that we're interested in. So they can tell us, you know, we would like you to do this to meet the science requirements. You need to visit these particular, you know, permanently shadowed regions or partially shadowed regions to be able to fulfill the, the mission, the mission objectives. So we actually have something that the team can produce for us which says, you're driving in this direction, you then turn perhaps like 10 degrees left, you will then do payload operation if you have a radar on board or a spectrometer on board or something else. So they can give us step by step each, uh, each sequence step of this mission. And what do we do? We turn it into a structure that can be used by the rover. So the rover, let's think about it as a, you know, a product. The rover is used as a component in MATLAB to perform this path, to perform this traverse. I think I have a photo that shows you what it looks like in a, in a second, but this is important to us because when the results are more, I mean, I wanna say real world, but you know, we're not on the moon, but they're more applicable than it would be to just do an arbitrary mission, you know, that doesn't represent anything of science value. So this to us 
was a very important step to be able to do this autonomously, you know, get this data here autonomously and then churned and made compatible with MATLAB. Okay, there we go, it was the next slide, Never mind. So, uh, for example, we might have a mission that looks like this, day one to day eight, perhaps, for the rover, about two and a bit kilometers to drive. So we, if you saw from before, we have the entire definition, you know, drive, turn, drive, turn, and this is what it will look like. So once you generate a traverse model, you know what the mission will look like. And from MATLAB, you also know things like charging points. So at which points do we need to stop and charge? Because the rover is discharged. The rover doesn't have enough power anymore, so you need to stop, orient towards the sun, and charge. Uh, those are the green points you can see there. Which points do we now have ground stations visibility? So we don't do direct communications with, uh, with Earth, unfortunately, from the rover, not yet. Uh, the lander will be the one that relays the communication link with, uh, with the ground. So at some points, depending on the, uh, you know, the, the phase and the movement of the moon, uh, we might have moments at which we have uh, downtime for our ground stations. We cannot communicate. So what does that mean? We cannot actually tell the operator, we cannot send commands to the rover. We need to wait. So we need to go in a low consumption, safe mode, uh, wait until the, you know, maybe the shadow is moved or something like this. Uh, so these points in red, I think they are, yes, line and uh, point in red, indicate to us that should we want to do this mission here, we need to be careful how we size it because otherwise we might have points at which we lose communication and we think there is a failure on the rover, but indeed it's not the rover. It's the ground stations not being communicable to. Uh, last but not least is the sun. So the team has developed a tool uh, called Mission Planning Toolkit, which can tell us horizon elevation levels and sun elevation levels for the landing latitude and the region of interest we are flying to. So what does it mean? At any point in this mission, the team can tell us, okay, in this segment, you're actually gonna have 0% uh, sun visibility because you're behind the hill or you're behind the mountain. Or you might have 65% visibility because it's not fully covered, but it starts to be covered depending on the time of the day. So this is important because why? We cannot charge. No sun means no charge, which means if we can't charge, we will die. So the rover will not be able to recover operations. So these black locations, we take into very careful consideration because it means we either need to change the mission slightly to avoid them, or we need to be in a safe mode or like, uh, let's say standby mode until these sun visibility points are restored. So just a little example of what it looks like, one of these outputs. And then other more, let's say normal, <laughs> more understandable outputs like power consumption. So you can see how much we consume throughout the mission for the entire, let's say, profile. Things like power generation. So depending, actually our rover that I'm simulating here on the screen uh, has solar panels on the side, which are tilted slightly by maybe six degrees or so. Uh, so we have sized the tilt angle depending on the latitude. Uh, and we wanted to do it in a way that we could optimize the charge. So we uh, wanted to make sure that whenever we turn towards the sun, we can get the best charge possible for that particular mission latitude. And that's what we're doing here. You can see we go um, uh, orange and blue because we don't just charge from one side, we do alternating. So we charge first on one and we do the next step, charge from this side. And then again, and again, to, to avoid wear and tear of one side of the solar panels, basically. And another one which is useful to us is the battery trend, so charge and discharge. You know, we start from uh, fully charged and then we start consuming, depending on which modes we're in. Uh, we have a depth of discharge level which we don't want to cross because it's dangerous for the battery. The battery might not be able to be recovered if you go below that. Uh, but nevertheless, you can see that when we start dipping too much, then, like you saw in the previous slide, the green spots, we would charge. So we would stop, turn, and charge. And that's when we go back up with the, uh, uh, with the steep lines over there. So some examples of what this looks like, but in terms of the actual fun stuff, how does this you know, reflect in a real world scenario, let's say as close as we can get it <laughs> scenario. So if we manage to design a mission which is uh, feasible within the virtual environment of MATLAB, Valley Space, et cetera, uh, we then go directly to our analog environments, uh, which are not the moon, but they are close enough. So we basically define uh, the same mission that you saw, the one you saw over there was quite extend, extended, so we don't have the same space available or same capability to perform two plus kilometer missions, but we can do segments of that mission and then simulate specific functions of the rover to see whether the rover actually will be surviving or, uh, or not. Uh, and this actually is, is my favorite part because yeah, okay, uh, tools are cool, but you know, when you get into the actual uh, lab over lunar yard that we call, and we can perform simulations in real time, you can, see, uh, you can see actual results from an actual prototype we were building, that's much more rewarding. You know, you know that you're developing something that, uh, that could work one day, you know, could go to the moon. Okay, 
so having talked about that, uh, this session will be a little bit redundant, I apologize, because a lot of good things were shared about, uh, about this today in terms of you know, leadership and uh, how to handle teams and how to organize them. But let me share some of the lessons that iSpace has learned throughout the, this process, because we now have a tool chain that we think is strong enough, even though after this one day of conference, I've heard very good ideas, which I will implement as soon as I can. Uh, but this is a strong product that we have developed. But how did we develop this? We had to develop it with a baseline or a foundation of team culture and teams working together. It would not have been possible by a single person. It would not have been possible by a single team even. It needed to include different aspects, both internal and external to the company, which uh, I'm gonna talk about to you guys uh, today. So, right, so together as one team. Uh, we are a multinational, multicultural team and cross-functional. And we have figured out that when you include as many people in the loop as you can, of course, without losing uh, the scope or losing the focus, uh, you perform the best. So you get the best possible ideas and the best possible results. Because you may be thinking that your way forward is the best, just like perhaps I was thinking that before today, that my tool chain was great. And then you speak with five people today and you find out that there is a new tool, or you find out there is a new way to use Valley Space or a new way. So this is the environment that has been the highest performing for us in the last couple of uh, months and years. And we're going to continue on this, uh, on this line in the next years to come. The Tuckman model, which many of you probably are familiar with, uh, forming, storming, norming, etc. So good things take time. You know, you couldn't have, in this case, the tool chain, but many things. You know, you couldn't have a product that's finished from the get-go. You would have missed so many requirements. You would have missed so many key aspects of a design, and then maybe found them in phase C or in the critical design review, and then that's it. That's your project. You ran out of funds. So. Things like getting the team accustomed to specific standards, getting a team accustomed to uh, a, a meeting standards, for example. You know, when do we meet? How do we meet? What do we share? How is the information stored? All of these kind of things which every single person today in the speakers uh, list has shared their own experience. This is very important and we take it very seriously. So we, it is not just you know, a mindset that you need to have. It needs to be an acumen that everyone in the team uh, possesses. So in such a dynamic setting, you need to be flexible and you need to have this acumen because if every day you're told, okay, you're gonna change this and tomorrow you're gonna change that and then, okay, let's prototype this on Friday and then, oh, by Monday, we're gonna do that all from scratch. Many people don't welcome this uh, with, uh, you know, open arms. To them, it's, it's a burden, you know, trying to fine tune these tools and figure out the best way, but you need to be flexible. You need to understand that, as I said, this is an example of a tool chain, but with many things, uh, we need to have patience and we need to be uh, welcome to change, which some people today talked about, constant change, which if handled well and managed well, can only bring good. So leadership is not a title. Again, something that everybody talked about today. Uh, it's rather a responsibility. So you might not have a title of leader, but if you are a leader on a day in, day out, people will follow and listen to what you do. So you will basically create uh, a foundation that people will believe in and will continue working on for the you know, years to come. So in iSpace, of course, we are quite large now. We used to be a very small team. Now we are a very large team. So we have titles. We have hierarchies. We have definitions of who is the managers, who is the leaders, et cetera. But this mindset of, you know, everyone needs to be outspoken and needs to be a leader at, uh, at principle is what we make very clear from the very first day and even during the interview, during why we interview people to hire them. We need to make sure they understand, you know, it's not because you are maybe an intern that you should be quiet during a meeting. But quite the opposite, quite the opposite. You should be the first one that speaks because you have been outside of a company, therefore you know more unbiased information and unbiased way forwards than we do. So uh, again, leadership versus management, similar, you know. They're not mutually exclusive. We found that the ideal is in between, basically lies in between of them. Uh, of course you need people that stir change and stir, you know, like uh, a way forward or stir kind of like uh, motivation. But at the same time you have KPIs. You know, you have uh, milestones that need to be achieved, you have uh, uh, key reviews that you need to do, you have budgets to control. So uh, the key, the winning strategy for us has been managers that can lead and uh, engineers within the respective teams that are not leaders, but behave as leaders. That's what we found is the best uh, way forward for us. Uh, that gave us the best results uh, in, the last, uh, in the last couple of phases of the project. And last but not least, yes, results definitely come from people, so always give fair space to your team and listen to them at any level. It doesn't matter what they do, it doesn't matter who they are, if they have something to say which is constructive and it's something that you may not have thought about, always give them a chance. That's, uh, to us, it's so very important. I mean, I can give you some examples of, you know, the designs uh, that we have proposed and some people would be, you know, quiet and not mention that there was a problem with it. And for many months, we wouldn't know. 
until we got to you know, the actual review, and then it got discovered. So it's uh, always, always promote communication. Communication, communication has been you know, a, uh, uh, a repeated concept today. So always promote, at any level, people to communicate with you. And of course, there is always gonna be someone who is more ambitious, someone that is louder, someone that is more maybe talented on the surface, but don't drown out the quiet. So I don't know if I'm being very clear with this, but some people don't share many things. Some people don't like to be you know, the ones that speak in meetings, they don't like to be the ones that uh, you know, inform a decision or give an opinion. That's something that we have learned to move away from because uh, although the ones that speak all the time might have good ideas, the ones that don't are the ones that listen the most and they're the ones that give the best ones. Even if they speak once out of 10 times, they give the best idea, always, always. For us, it's always been that. So, you know, foster this communication level with them. If they're still uncomfortable, have one-on-ones with them. You know, make sure they get comfortable in the situation. So, it takes time, it takes patience. You know, we took as many, many months to all different cultures. So, always promote new ideas and new voters, like I said. Uh, there is no or very little status quo in startups. So admittedly, maybe we're not uh, uh, as much of a startup anymore, but uh, we have, uh, we're basically under the effect of change still every single day, which is good and bad, of course. If you handle it well, it's good, but you, know, you need to make sure that new voices are heard and new voices are taken seriously. So not just, yeah, 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 that's a good idea, thanks. No, it's actually you know, reflected upon what people are sharing with you. If people are sharing things with you, it's because they think it has value. So always reflect on it and always find a way to integrate it within the, the life cycle. Another point which I forgot who mentioned it, but it was a very good one and uh, applies to us too, is embrace the evolution of your people. People will change. People will grow out of their roles. People will professionally develop. People will, might, might not want to do the same role for five, six plus years. People might want to grow. So don't stint them. Don't hinder them just because they're very good at their job. Don't block them and say, you're always gonna be a thermal engineer. You're always gonna be a, a you know, structural engineer because you're just very good at what you're doing. If that person you know, communicates that it's time to grow and to grow out of a specific role, provide the resources, provide the training. Uh, I can tell you for several reasons, this has proved much more useful to us in terms of you know, people retainment, so staying with, uh, in the company, but also in terms of morale because people actually felt like, yes, okay, I'm going to be a lead engineer, I will be a project manager now, but I will still be available if you ask me a thermal question. I will still be available and respond to you. I've not disappeared completely. I'm not you know, a lost token in the company. So this harmony environment that's set up by just simple communication, you know, simple back and forth, really made a difference for us. And last but not least, already mentioned, change is normal. So uh, you know, it's often not even normal. It just has to happen. It's necessary. So manage it well, and uh, you will reap the results uh, from it, I can guarantee you. Okay, so out of time, of course, apologies, but uh, we finish up today with a summary of all that we talked about. So the present and future of our company and new space, which is enabled by uh, tools and the tool chains that are provided by market leaders and also developed in-house to make sure that we can work collaboratively, collaboratively between different ones. Centralized tools to make sure our designs are valid and can work in any life cycle stage of a project. Uh, enabled by multidisciplinary teams, multicultural teams that think in different ways, but at the same time have the same foundations, they have the same way of you know, respecting each other or allowing to communicate with different hierarchy levels. So even though you're Japanese and I'm Italian, even though you are American and you're Colombian, some foundations are always there. Some foundations of respect uh, are always there. So this is enabled by the vision and the values of the sector. I mean, needless to say, this is our mission. This is what the company does. But from hearing from everyone today, uh, I've heard equally, if not more, you know, uh, ambitious goals and amazing projects and missions going on right now, and extremely ambitious, extremely visionary in, uh, in, in state. So uh, this industry will really grow and uh, give a lot of opportunities of cross-functional leadership to different people in the, in the years to come. So I'm very excited, and uh, of course for iSpace, but also beyond that. So uh, let's, see, let's see how it develops. And one last quote, since everybody put a quote, so I gotta put a quote. But I really like this quote. Uh, that's actually, in my interview for iSpace, I had this like very large on a piece of paper in front of me because I am very technical, very pragmatic, and very structured, but I'm also quite creative, and I've often been shut down in my, let's say, uh, profession or in my uh, academia for it. So you need people that dream and have vision and have ambition, and you have people that do things. But at the same time, what we need the most is dreamers that actually act and prove by action and do. 
So these are not mutually exclusive. If there is one message you can take today, these are not mutually exclusive. You can be someone with a vision, with a passion, for example, the people that presented to you today, and you can make sure that you infuse this level of passion, you infuse this, uh, this uh, excitement you know, in the rest of the teams, whatever you do. So I can leave you with this, uh, with this today. And that's it. Thank you so much for your time.